reception. It was around, it's at around one o'clock in the morning, so nobody was really up uh, Friday night, but all those bloggers who were online. And uh, uh, when it happened, the first pieces of news came on Facebook and Twitter that Michael Jackson was dead. And I instantly switched on the television, obviously the printed, uh, uh, the print media uh, was going to be like at least uh, a day late, uh, even two, because that was on the weekend. So I switched on uh, BBC and CNN, and there was just nothing on them. And a couple of minutes later, uh, it came uh, like... Um, mm, uh, came, came on the screen that um, unconfirmed information that Michael Jackson was dead. And actually they got the information from Twitter. And that was very unconfirmed by the next day, until the next day. So, yeah, um, I think that the future of uh, a journalist uh, is, is not much different uh, the role of a future journalist is not much different than it, it's been in the last ten, 10 years. You have to look at all those uh, means of communications, what you can deal with, and put them together and uh, find a good mentor who can teach you the BBC kind of journalism, actually the difference between different kinds of journalism. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you very much. Maybe the BBC will come to the rescue. Um, <laughs> what, what do you think, Evan? Well, I think these are the best of times and the worst of times, and sometimes it scares the dickens out of me. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, the best of times. Yes, I agree with uh, Frank that, um, and, and all of you, I think, that it's very refreshing not to have the news be captive of a small group of elites. I think this is a really positive development. I'll give you an example. Uh, in Pakistan several years ago, when Benazir Bhutto was assassinated, um, the Pakistani media were, under the regulations there, unable to broadcast uh, normally or publish normally what was going on. So a dentist, a dentist, a man who works on the teeth, uh, who was a blogger, uh, who liked to look out of his window of his office and write blogs about how beautiful uh, Pakistan is, suddenly found himself looking out and seeing violent protests out of his window. He turned out to be in a very strategic place. I don't know if any of you know about him. He's the Teeth Maestro is his blog. Famously, <laughs> famously, um, he began to be a good source of information for people about where are the demonstrations, either because they wanted to join them or avoid them. And so his blog became suddenly a political factor. He never intended this. This was not his goal. But suddenly this dentist was catapulted into fame. Then it turned out the government declared that Benazir Bhutto had hit her head on the top of her sunroof of her car and, uh, as she was coming up and down and that this is what had killed her. But of course, someone had captured a video using new tools, mobile tools, and had captured a video that made it extremely clear that her head was bouncing back because she had been shot. You could just tell. So this video was really hot property, and the person who shot it, shot the video, um, could not take it anywhere. It was too dangerous in Pakistan to do this. And all the media were shut down, basically, because of the unrest. So what was this person to do? This person somehow got the video to the tooth, the teeth maestro. And he, now this is not just a lesson in how great the new media are. He managed to smuggle it in a way that it was given to Dawn, a major publication there, and eventually it made itself onto television. So the lesson here is not just journalism can be done by random people at random times who are not trained and not paid. Yes, we all know that, and that can be extremely cool. But also that the voice of authority that traditional media or that empowered organizations and institutions have is a necessary part of the equation, at least so far. And if you read Clay Shirky's book, Here Comes Everyone, everybody rather, um, his examples which celebrate new media, Twitter, 
Facebook. I'm not even sure Twitter was popular when he was writing this, but he was crowdsourcing. He was very excited about all this. Every example in his book cites, and it got the attention of the New York Times, or it got the attention of the BBC. So we're talking about the emergence here of a hybrid, which is extremely cool. So in the best of times, when I think about it that way, it's because we're getting all kinds of expert stuff out there, pictures, ideas, wisdom from people who weren't allowed that platform before. It's terrific. But in the best of times, they're partnering with some editing, some curating, some fact-checking, and in the best of times, the public, both in producing and consuming this, knows the difference between entertainment and a serious news story. And that's a critical piece. Okay, so that's the best of times. What's the worst of times, then? Why am I worried? Well, I think about Richard Goldstone's work in South Africa on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And Richard is a guest teacher here at CEU this semester. And what I've learned from him is that one of the problems in any society that's divided is you need one history. You need one common set of facts. If you don't have that, you may never settle your differences. You may never be able to maximize the values of civil society and community. And I happen to have spent my life as a journalist trying to verify facts and present important facts. Um, I was often dragged into celebrity stuff. Sure, that was fun, sex, titillation, really cool. Um, but man, that does not nourish the public space. And so if it's the worst of times as well as the best of times, um, I'm afraid I'm going to quote one more dead uh, British uh, literary figure. Um, <laughs> see if I can find the exact quote. Um, it's because we are actually, um, uh, I can't get it right, wandering, uh, lost wandering between two worlds, one dead and the other powerless to be born is what Matthew Arnold said. I'd say the other struggling to be born. It's not powerless to be born, but we do not yet have the kind of um, uh, truth test, the kind of media literacy in publics ready to take advantage of the absolute wealth of information we've got, but also the necessary uh, hybrid, the necessary partner that comes with some wisdom that I'm afraid comes with paying attention, being consistently there to watch what goes on, not just showing up as part of a flash mob because you happen to have time that day. It's deeply important to have both. And my worry is not that we won't have all the cool Twitter stuff. That's happening without any trouble at all. My worry is that we are not going to have the real vetted, fact-based stuff that I think Esther started talking about. So um, I do worry, as Neil Postman said, that we're amusing ourselves to death. Thank you. Just some very quick questions for all of you before we go to the audience. I mean, Ellen, you've written in the past. I was digging around and checking my facts uh, back in 1999, I think, that the, the, the problem with um, old media was that it was too top-down and autocratic uh, and that uh, in the age of the Internet, uh, the user was every bit as important as the provider and that maybe uh, the fact-finding process uh, in it, as it plays out in new forms was maybe more important than the facts. But what you're saying now seems to you know, throw out a worry that maybe the facts are uh, the thing we need to be worried about finding them, or do you still think the process is? Well, um, I think journalism is no, more, no longer a commodity or a product. It's a flow. It's a process. It's a set of values. Um, it's a continuum. And um, I don't care if the person who does it is a professional who's paid or someone who's doing it for free and anonymously. I just care about the quality of what it is, and I need to know where it came from and why this person believes it's true. And if they don't tell me why they believe it's true or they don't have some sort of brand platform that I've generally trusted, um, then I'm not going to believe it. And I think that's the problem. The facts are contested now. There is no voice of authority. There are too many voices of authority, so there is none uh, left. That's what I'm worried about. OK, 
Okay, thanks. Um, <coughs> and Esther, I, I like what you were saying about Twitter and the Iranian Revolution, but uh, also how there is this kind of parasitism, uh, second-hand quality to um, a lot of what you will get on Twitter uh, and the blogosphere on uh, mainstream media. Uh, and to what extent, I wonder whether or not the blogosphere has almost been created uh, out of a crisis within uh, the mainstream media, the way that... Uh, Frank was talking about the kind of uh, obsessive people in their mother's bedrooms commenting and analysing everything all the time. Um, is, there a sense, is there a possibility that that's been kind of thrown up by a crisis within journalism that ha ha has given up on, on, on checking the facts itself? Or is it an independent phenomenon? Do we need this external analysis or could it be done maybe through the media more? Uh, as to how it started, um, blogs were, were first blogs were commentaries on news items. That was the first form in the early 90s. So in that sense, often professionals, even professional journalists, journalists collected some interesting articles and published them only in terms of, you know, links and commented. Um, that was something like sharing and forming a community, checking facts. Now, what blogs are today is what a very serious um, survey calls meaningless bubble. Hundreds of millions of blogs are meaningless bubble. And the same goes for Twitter, even though the American... Uh, Library of Congress decided to archive it all, you know, to capture the fleeting moment. Uh, and it is parasitic on mainstream media. And uh, to get back to the, the final question, I think that um, wh what is happening is boundaries becoming permeable. So you can get, you can sh be a shooting star from YouTube just by showing how to, you, to do makeup or funny dancing or whatever. And which is not a bad thing because in theory you can also be a shooting star when there is lack of facts, when there is an oppressive media. And I think that's extremely important. But it will never replace uh, the kind of journalism that we don't have. So actually, I don't know if it really matters. <laughs> okay, Frank, um, can I just ask you about the two problems you identified? One, the lack of seriousness and the lack of checking. Uh, and two, the journalism of attachment. If you could just explain that slightly, because can we see them as the same problem? Is it, is it the lack of checking that allows you to become an attached journalist who can kind of move into a, a, a role of moral arbiter, if you like? You know, I've been to Zimbabwe. I don't like what I see. You shouldn't like what I see. Um, be emotional about it. Do something. Rather than uh, a more objective report that wouldn't lend itself so easily to uh, that kind of journalism of attachment you mentioned. How do they relate, those two points? Well, I, I think that... Uh all these relate ultimately to the fact that uh, journalists at the, at, at, in the early 21st century do not take ideas very seriously. I think that's a real problem, that ideas are pretty much seen as a kind of throwaway commodity that you can mess around with, play around with. And I think that's the characteristic of offline and online. And I don't accept the, the fact that online journalism is simply parasitical and offline. It is. Because I think online journalism is also parasitical in online journalism, in the way that Eva is talking about it. And I'm not surprised that Hungarian newspapers were not able to establish online, you know, sort of platforms, because they neither have the, you know, English-speaking ones, I and mean, they all have them. But there's very few of them that have been particularly successful. And, and what they've done is they've used uh, sort of countercultural influences as a way of giving them the kind of cultural authority. But there's a, an important logical priority, and, and, and that really is the point that Esther made, which I think is really crucial. You gave the example of Iran, and you said, well, it's interesting that here are these Iranian bloggers, and they're using English. But what they've done is exactly the same thing what the Chinese students did in Tiananmen Square. When the, when the shootings occurred in Tiananmen Square, 
was pretty much the time when 24-hour news first began to kick in, and CNN for the first time had news nonstop. And at a certain point, and I think this is a tragedy, at a certain point the Chinese students said, we're going to have, have these kind of slogans, and they were all in English. They weren't in Chinese, they were all in English. The reason why they did it is exactly the same reason why the Iranians did it, is because they were talking to the, an American or an English audience you know, rather than to their own people. And I think that's the fundamental flaw of progressive people and liberal journalism, is that they've lost the capacity to engage with normal human beings. They, they talk, either talk to themselves or to their mates in a, on a blog, but they are very, very bad at talking to normal beings. And in this research project that I'm doing on public opinion, I'm really struck by the fact that, if, for example, right-wing you know, sort of politicians are much more at speaking the idiom of everyday life because their job is to talk to ordinary human beings, whereas liberal journalists on and offline are just talking of their rear ends. I mean, they, really, they literally are using a language that, you know, I mean, that is, is incomprehensible to anybody other than that see you, you know, sort of. But if you go to the Ask or to Budapest, nobody would understand what you're saying. And journalism has, is really not addressing that kind of issue. And I think that is the principal problem. And that, that leads journalists to this journalism attachment, because having become frustrated at their inability to communicate, having lost belief in serious ideas, well, what's the next big idea? It's myself, you know? <laughs> yeah. you know, because, you know, it's not that difficult to take yourself seriously, right? You don't take ideas seriously, but, you know, well, you know, how do I look this morning? You know, sort of, what do you think of me? All the rest of that, how do I feel, you know? And that's what journalism is fast becoming. And I think there's a very, da very, very important danger here, because in Europe at the moment, there's two worlds. There's the cosmopolitan media, and then there is what's, what's going on underneath. It's what a German sociologist called the spiral of silence. There's a reason for that. Of course there is, yeah. There's more than, more than one I know reason. It's, it's I'm just going to be very quick. There's a reason for this uh, journalism attachment, which I think you correctly diagnosed, this, this narcissism. Why? I mean, I'm, I think this crowd knows why. Because we're in an attention economy. We have to fight to have our voice heard out there, whether we're a blogger or an advertiser or a politician. And in that kind of a world, you have to become more outrageous, you have to become louder, more passionate, um, more crazy, and you have to have an identity. So popularity, as you know, if you use Dig, that service that helps surface things, or you see which are the most emailed stories of the day, popularity is the metric of the news business today. I regret that. I think it's terrible. I preferred to be very unpopular as a journalist because it meant I was writing something painful and true. But popularity is there because that's the business model today. And it's the business model because of the wealth of resources we have on the internet. Yeah, but then uh, in that case, we should take that on board and, and uh, acknowledge the fact that journalism has lost its way in a very fundamental sense and ask some serious question, you know, is, is it possible in the 21st century to be a journalism worth its name, either online or offline, or should we just, you know, go into what is in fact personal psychological fiction and just leave it at that and give up on the whole? I'll bring you both in, Ava and then Esther, and then out to you, but that, that's a very important point, I think, for people to think about. Is the business model completely broken? Is it only broken in the West? Because... Uh, print media, traditional print media, is doing very well um, in China, Brazil, India, for example. But even in the West, um, publications like The Economist, and this may speak to Ava's uh, specialization point, uh, are very profitable, uh, very serious, uh, and uh, you know, certainly not narcissistic. So before we throw out all the business model with the bathwater, that's something to continue with. Ava, your thoughts, and then Esther, quickly, and then we'll go out to the audience. Yeah, what I was going to say is about the business model. Let me just draw a parallel line uh, between journalism and advertising. Uh, like until 10 years ago, uh, the uh, main structure of advertising theoretically was a very uh, top-down kind of structure. The advertiser talked to the masses of people. And it has profoundly changed it throughout the last 10 years because people had enough of someone talking to them without the... Uh, Having, having the possibility or the chance talking back or 
be part of the conversation rather. So that's what's exactly happening to journalism as well, that an authoritative kind of journalist who talks uh, from the top, uh, it's, uh, it's not going to... Uh, it's not going to be a very sim not going to have a very sympathetic role. So uh, it's not only the masses of people who have to be part of the conversation, um, as like in the user-generated content or the social media. It's the the role of the journalist itself is changing as well because the journalists have to apply um, have to apply all these modes of communications uh, to be heard to be read. Uh, and that's what brands do, like all the, uh, the big, um, um, big, uh, big brands. And let's not forget that it's not only a bad journalist, but the brand of the journal, the brand of the media itself. So they have to establish themselves in the next couple of years as well. Um, and that the key, I say it again, it's specialization and the mixture of the fact-based journalism and experience in the new media. Um, I, I very much agree uh, with both of you um, that uh, user-generated content can have a very important role, but I tend to think that uh, it's applies to small communities. May, it, it might be communities of interest or actual geographic communities. So the more successful uh, citizen media rises around like small regions because it's easier to, you know, fa check facts. When you have like, I don't know, 500 million people out there, it's even difficult to digest what they contribute. And let me finish with what uh, Pierre Omidyar, uh, founder of eBay, said uh, regarding his new project, which is uh, establishing a community-based um, journal, online journal for um, Hawaii and Honolulu uh, specifically. And he says that <laughs> it's a great mistake to uh, let people remain anonymous. It's a great mistake to let users comment because all they do is spit mud and I don't want to go on because there will be many dirty words that I could come up with and we all know that's what uh, uh, many commentators do for fun, I guess. And they just have that kind of well, psychological makeup. Um, I know it's not my turn, but this is a question of self-regulation of internet of the internet. Okay, it's so that's area. something we can bring up. Do we have a handheld microphone? Okay, Ava. So if I could see, I have two. Brilliant, brilliant. So put your hands up if you'd like to uh, give us some user-generated content. Uh, and I'll, t I'll take clusters of points uh, and questions at a time, so three, four, or five of you, so don't be shy. Who would like to speak? All right, I'll start it off. Um, what you're all sort of pointing to is the fact that it's a good combination that we have right now between these kind of the traditional news media and the new, uh, the new media and the blogs and all this kind of thing, Twitter. Uh, but part of the problem is that people don't know how to filter this information. And so it's kind of a basic question, but for all the people that are growing up in this new media, um, how do you teach this kind of media literacy to them? What kind of very real strategies are there to convey the difference between these different sources? Okay, a <clears throat> very good question. Let's have a few more and then we'll get some reaction. While people are collecting their thoughts, can I just jump in? I'd like us to go back to the question of, um, of whether or not the system of journalism, of newsmaking was broken before the Internet was taking over as such a dominant site. And I think that piece sometimes, for me at least, gets lost in the discussion of the impact of the Internet, the Internet of 
social networking, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the things that was really heightened in the U.S., and I think here you could talk more about the ownership that was um, situated more in partisanship and the relationships with political parties. In the U.S., it's more about the impact of commercialism and the level of corporate um, ownership. And these are things that were taking hold, uh, you know, I would say, potentially irrespective of, of the developments of things shifting to a new environment. The system was having serious, serious issues. The Chicago Tribune, to use a very American example, buys the Los Angeles Times, lays off Pulitzer Prize winning journalists. And that pressure for a greater return on the investment of the um, newspaper or television station being a commodity itself we focused on print. We look at the U.S. and the impact of something like the 1996 Telecommunications Act, which allowed for a greater consolidation of media ownership. I just wanted to throw that back out. Again, I'm using U.S. Mm -hmm. examples. The ownership could be at the corporate level. It could be at the, um, at the partisanship level. But I'd like to go back to that and see how much of it were problems that were, were predated and th there was a huge gap and the reason so much independent media was coming of age and taking the first advantage online I think was because of the, um, the failures of the, the, the system of journalism as it was um, starting to, to decline. <coughs> Would any of the people who are twittering like to comment on <laughs> Frank's accusation that they might be taking themselves too seriously? <laughs> Or and while I'm holding the mic, that. I realized <laughs> oh, sorry. when we uh, were first starting and I was welcoming this, the Ferenc's students from uh, ELTA, I forgot to mention I didn't see Shandor Orban in the back also and his students from Budapest College of Communication. So please, any of you all that would like to, um, to jump in on this, please don't hesitate. Yes, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, I detected um, a note of nervousness from the fourth estate um, but I feel that perhaps the fourth estate should also think about being positive and how to co-opt um, what is clearly the shifts that you all talked about. We've, we've, we've got a situation now of the empowerment of the individual citizen. Um, and that, in many respects, and you've given lots of examples, should be considered as a very good thing putting checks and balances in, maybe. But what I would like to hear a little bit more about is how to make the most of that active citizen in the whole business of the future of the fourth estate. I, mean, I think that the, uh, the key missing concept in this discussion is the role of the public. Because uh, journalists don't just write for themselves, or they shouldn't just write for themselves. And the quality of ideas and the quality of debate is always intimately linked to the quality of the public conversation. And it seems to me that many of the uh, accusations that are often laid at the, uh, at the door of, of journalism are, you know, are, are, are at least in an indirect sense linked to the fact that in the outside world, outside of journalism, the quality of the discussion you know, may not be sufficient, sufficient to generate the kind of ideas that are really sort of quite important. I think it's, it's the link between the two that, that I see as being really important. And uh, somebody asked the question, you know, how do you teach people to become journalists? Well, actually you don't. You know, really good journalists are not the products of journalism schools. And actually they're not the products of mentors either. I think really good journalists are come about to the heat of public engagement. They often become really good journalists because they can write. And the question is, you know, what do you learn to write? And I think learning how to write is something you can do as much in a Hungarian literature or English literature or in any other kind of environment where teaching, uh, uh, writing, and communicating and ideas, you know, sort of is part of the, the bread and butter. And that in many respects, instead of being worried about, you know, how do we learn to write and how do we learn to communicate, I think the really important thing is how we politically engage, how we philosophically or intellectually engage with the wider public, because that's really where, the, where the, everything begins to break down. When you haven't got that kind of relationship, I think then we end up with a very big problem, and I, I, I do hope that that's something that we can, we can deal with. Just one final point. The citizen journalism is really a misnomer, because most of what we call citizen journalism is just citizens providing their version of events information. And sometimes they provide really important information, really important facts that are, are really, uh, you've got to take seriously. 
that still leaves open the question of how we use the facts. And that's really where journalism comes in. And I think at the moment, there's a danger of collapsing the provision of information with journalism, uh, whereas in fact they're two discrete phenomena. Good. First of all, I think the most important thing we can do to be media literate is to listen very carefully. And Frank, I think that's what you're saying journalists, professional journalists haven't been doing. I agree with you that 99 and 99 one hundredth of what's passing for news is crap. Uh, I wouldn't waste my time on it. Uh, and so fortunately, because I was a journalist for 19 years, I know kind of where to go and what to look for. So how do people do this? Well, first of all, the power has shifted from the producers who are professional to the public, and not just the power to create, but you have to figure out what's true and what's false, because no longer is there a voice of authority out there that you can turn to that you know day in and day out is going to have the right version of events that you can trust. It just doesn't happen the way it used to, and it didn't used to be as trustworthy as some people thought. So, you are now in power. The problem with power is it also has responsibility. And what are your responsibility? Well, I really loved your question about media literacy. It wasn't about how to be a journalist, Frank. It was how to navigate this wonderful pipe full of sex and sewage and really important videos of Netta being killed. How do we navigate this? Fortunately, smart people are working on this. Um, and there is a curriculum developed that's being taught at a place in New York called Stony Brook. And some academic communities are open to the notion that it's a basic skill for students to learn not just critical thinking, but critical producing and consuming of information. It's a research skill. It's a dissemination skill. But media literacy is a really important new area for, I think, scholarship. And I know I'm taking too much time, but I also wanted to give a perfect example of what we heard about this, this notion that the journalists were out of touch with the people. 99% yes. But there's some terrific examples today of this hybrid that people here in the, have been talking about. One of them is from Poland. Gazeta Wyborska, a very famous paper in this region, um, recently, I just learned this today from my colleague Bill Mitchell, those of you who are at the seminar will hear, will remember this. He posted, um, there had been a report that the, the pregnant women of Poland were just unhappy with how the bribes, and not the bribes, but the, the quality of the service in the maternity hospitals. They just, there were stories out there. But how are they going to get that? How are they, they didn't have a lot of people who could go from door to door and figure out who's pregnant, who's got a story to tell. This is where new media are perfect, right? They posted it. They asked for people to contribute their stories. And they got a wealth of information from the ordinary Polish public who had become partners in journalism, right? And while no money changed hands to pay these lar uh, legions of reporters out there, they got a role. They got some power in this. And 413 hospitals were ranked according to the feedback from this huge deluge of information from the public. There are problems with this model. What if you happen to hit a group of hy hypercritical people or you missed a minority group that has a different practice for birth? It's not perfect. But I think that's an example of the kind of crowdsourcing together with the platform and hopefully the editing, not the BBC model that you just talked about, but really vetted stuff that makes for a very dynamic new future for journalism. Thank you. It was a great example because we in Hungary had just such a sight what happened. It was about, it's kind of hard to explain because there is no English word for it. But you know, you're supposed to pay, bribery. yeah, bribery, okay. <laughs> well, it's almost. Or a tip. A tip, tip, well, the, but it's like, you know, a significant amount of money. So there was a young would-be father who was worried about how, it, how much you're supposed to pay. And he started collecting uh, feedback from mothers who went through this experience, and they could tell how much money they actually gave uh, in, in, in various hospitals to various uh, a uh, gynecologist and uh, the poor guy 
got sued by all the doctors and the hospitals and even uh, or ombudsman for um, rights of person. Pardon me? For collecting the private details. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it may happen in some countries. <laughs> it's not going to happen here. Well, uh, finally, the, the, the guy just took down. And uh, just one more point. I, I, I do agree that the um, downfall of uh, media started before the blogosphere uh, shut up. Um, touchy feely stuff, big pictures, uh, human interest stories, and the like. Uh, I do think it's because um, this is what audiences are interested in. And but just one more. Um, we'll like come back on it later. Okay. Okay. Or, yeah, very quickly, but then okay, I'm let's gonna see quick. it. So uh, I really don't wanna be. The one who um, the one who celebrates the um, the new media here and uh, and the social media, but actually, I think I understand the danger of losing real journalism. But I would be so much more worried about the new media law system and the political and the economical system right right now in Hungary than the new the danger of the new media. I know that the tra uh, the traditional role of a journalist has been changing throughout the last 10 years or so, but uh, it's not the biggest fear right now, I think. Can I see you'd like to speak and contribute to this point? Because I think there are some interesting things coming out. There's a gentleman there, but um, there's a question really about whether or not citizens can be journalists. I happen to think they can't, but there's also the other side of it is whether or not journalism is for citizens. Should it be made uh, accessible, filtered, um, something that citizens can navigate? Or is that something they can uh, do for themselves? Because there's been a lot of um, soul-searching within the journalistic uh, profession, if you like, to come up with new news values, uh, as if the old news, um, representing the truth about the world, uh, somehow wasn't good enough, that we'd have to find things that would be interesting for people. So uh, consumer law telling you about the latest domestic gadgets. You know, every paper you open it says ranking of this iPod's better than that, uh, Blackberry and so on, which is to take a very kind of functional view of, of the news uh, rather than what I wonder we might explore very quickly is, is there not just something democratically um, good about news in itself? Does it not have a, a value in itself and as a way of representing our experiences in the world. So thoughts on that, if you would. But the gentleman here first. Um, my question would be just basically for all of you just, just to contemplate on a, for a second. Um, if, you, if we take a look at, let's see, just in the European uh, perspective, uh, the, the, the framework is similar, right? So we've, we've got a kind of a tradition of an emerging uh, infotainment uh, throughout the media. We have a, um, a tradition, of, we, we've had a 15, 20 years of tradition of fragmentization of the audiences. We no longer have the big media contents that unifies the public, etc., etc. But we have Basically, we have experience, and we have the new media in every country, right? So we have it in England, in Ireland, we have it in Poland, in in Romania, and many other countries. But so, therefore, the structural basis is in a, in a certain respect similar. But still, in certain countries, uh, regardless of the transformation of the audience, of the content, of the structure, and everything, you still find good journalism. You still find. Uh, good, you still find audience who is willing to pay attention to longer messages than 15 seconds. And in certain other countries, you would find less. In certain countries, the whole media is really <clears throat> nothing about just the, um, just the, uh, the, the majority of the media really supports the polarization of, of the country, like in this country, for instance. In other countries, you would still find a, a, a middle ground, uh, which gives a more, uh, a more um, um, delicate uh, kind of discussion about. Uh, so, so what I'm, what I'm asking, I'm a sociologist. Probably, 
could find out based on my comment. So, uh, so I'm not. Uh, so, so we shouldn't bash. I think the journalist, and and of course not the audience, because the audience is always right. I think, but at the same time, we have to ask the question: What makes societies uh, doing this way or doing that way? That's my question for you. Okay, thanks. Um, and there was another hand up. I think, yeah, there. <coughs> to ask a question uh, concerning the authority of uh, professional media mm. outlets. So, um, uh, yeah, speaking, um, hold in, Mike, up and forth. Yeah, can we uh, say that uh, um, citizen journalism and bloggers really challenge their authorities because um, bloggers are after, sometimes after uh, getting into the media coverage and uh, quoted by uh, professional media and professional media will quote them and use their use them as sources but uh, if we are uh, thinking of that uh, because uh, they have the they have the tools to spread uh, this information but uh, so is it uh, the whole system of this hierarchy challenged if we are thinking of that okay it's a very good so question. they are just used as sources of information yeah, artists and journalists and bloggers are a threat to authority in any way. Um, any more? Take a couple more. There's one there. It wasn't, it wasn't for oh, no, no, no. It's just, it's just actually waving, waving at his friends. Yeah. Frank, do you want to come back in? And then yeah. Alan and then I, I, I was recently in Washington um, at a conference organized by the State Department there about blogging and uh, just the whole war on terror and the uh, media communication dimension of that. And I was talking to a guy who's in charge of dealing with jihadist and Islamic bloggers and websites. And I can tell you it is a huge threat to authority in terms of the impact that it has. And that's just one area where if you look at the role of these websites, they are phenomenally popular among young Islamic kids in France, Holland, Belgium, Scandinavia and many other parts of the world, they have massive audiences, I mean, really massive audiences. And they, to me, show you the potential there is for challenging these things. The other thing I did, when I was in, I, I, in, in the project that I'm, I'm, I'm doing, I mean, I'm looking at uh, alternative sources of information. And one of the things I'm very interested in is the way that the new media is now providing stories that fundamentally put to question the official version of events. So, for example, in, in America, the Center for Disease Control, which deals with epidemics, swine flu, and everything else, if you look on their website, they are spending a considerable amount of their time countering rumors about diseases of various sorts, you know, basically because, for example, like when the swine flu epidemic broke out globally, it came on, on Twitter and it came on social network, and, and most of the people first gained information about what the swine flu was by looking at these uh, social networking websites, because none of the official sites, you know, sort of had kind of caught up with that. And then, you know, they un invariably got the wrong information. And poor old CDC, they had to spend all this time kind of countering it. So it's a, it's a phenomenally powerful thing. Um, and, 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 and therefore, I think that's what's so interesting and, to me, exciting about it. I just want to say one thing about countries. Getting back to Poland. I think Poland is a very interesting example, because... Uh, um, I, I've done a, a few interviews and wrote articles for the Polish press. And, and I've been astounded by the way it stands out in Europe as an incredibly intelligent uh, and, and, and an incredible you know, sort, of, you know, sort of resource that you have there, where they have articles on philosophical and political issues every week, you know, very long articles that are widely read. Uh, in a way that's unthinkable in the English-speaking world or in, fr or in France. In Germany, there used to be a, f a, few, a few magazines like that that, that, that kind of catered for that. And you ask the question, well, why is that? Because I, I, you know, I never thought that Poland was particularly, you know, I mean, there might be some Polish people here, but I never thought it, was, it, it stood out as, as an intellectual kind of capital of Europe. But when you go to Poland, you realize what it is. In, 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 in Poland, you have one thing that you don't have in England, in Hungary, or anywhere else, which is a very big substantial liberal intelligentsia. And you also yeah, have yeah. a very large media market, and there is a connection between the size of the market and the quality of the journalism. I, I, but I think it's the audience that, that I'm struck by. That you, you know, you can, you know, if I do a meeting in, in Warsaw, I can get you know, sort of 800 people who want, who want to talk about politics, 
you know, in, in, in London, I would get four, you know, and that would be three of my relatives, and one stranger would come in there, and that's, that's a, quite a big difference. The reason is they're cell-shocked and prattle-fatigued, Frank. Um, okay, sociology, absolutely. A public culture is essential for good journalism, essential. And if you don't have a public that knows the difference between Michael Moore and his crazy videos that include propaganda and then some things that seem really true and really interesting, and you can't parse that because you don't take the time or you don't educate yourself or nobody helps you figure it out, um, then you're going to have a public that accepts garbage as news. And unfortunately, I see that in the USA more and more. And more. However, I would like to pay honor to those who continue to struggle against this popular tide. And I'd say there still are remnants of a public culture um, in virtually everywhere I've gone that somehow witnesses emerge, people who want the truth to be known emerge in even the most desperate environments, and they find a way to do this. And that's the hope end of this. But in Poland, just to speak about Poland in particular, the tradition of the press in Poland, and if anyone here is a Polish person, I hope you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the tradition is an intellectual journalism tradition. It's the journalism of argument and partisan uh, intellectual uh, discourse. And that's true to some extent in France as well. That is not the tradition of fact-based journalism that came out of the pubs of England and went to America. And one of the interesting uh, experiments going on right now in the Czech Republic is Nashe Adresa. Anybody here from the Czech Republic? Um, it's a cafe, just like the old pubs in England, um, where people come in to have coffee to tell their gossip and to hear from others what is the gossip. They've actually routinized this to make it into a news cafe where the journalists are actually working there in the cafe. Uh, so the good news is this is going back to the roots of how news is created, and it gets to Frank's critique of being connected to the public. It's hyper-local. It's interesting. The trouble is, economically, they're going to get 20% of their money from the coffee, which was good, <laughs> but the whole thing didn't work. It failed. So these experiments are out there. I'd love to see research on your question about which cultures produce the best journalism. I don't know the answer to that. So we don't have a lot of time left, so we're obviously going to leave room for the panel to make closing remarks. But I could just see who'd like to, to speak still, so I've got a feeling for that. And everybody who hasn't, here is your last chance. You'll, you'll kick yourself afterwards. Can I just in, well, if there wasn't anybody, just with a really quick comment just a in question. a way of trying to frame what do we look to for the future, where do we look to, not just what are the models that are going to be developed, but with my kind of policy hat, is there a role for, for policy to address any of these issues? And when we look at one of the big shifts, right, when we look at a more traditional media system, and in particular I'm speaking more to broadcasting, there was some kind of role, even in the U.S., with a very strong kind of, you know, libertarian instinct on... on a, freedom of the, the, the press and speech and the First Amendment, which is so significant, there's still a role that government could play in terms of requiring there to be a certain amount of what was deemed you know, broadcasting in the public interest. And that was really cut um, over the last 20, 30 years. And when we shift to an online environment, the value of having a space that isn't controlled, that doesn't have that relationship to the state, because you're not talking about licenses and broadcasting spectrum, are we then really left to the public to make the determination? And on one hand, are okay, we getting what we ask for, <clears> or are we just amusing ourselves to death? Okay. Ourselves? There will be um, a chance afterwards. The CEU, CMCS have laid on um, some wine and pogash, I think is, is, is the word. Pogaccia. 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 Yeah. Pogaccia. Happy, happy to correct it, but I think they're tasty anyway. So we can uh, continue the discussion uh, in the lobby after this uh, for an hour. So I'm going to ask the speakers to sum up now. Um, in the order they spoke. So, Esther, if you'll start, just your final thoughts, maybe a um, minute and a half or so, nothing more. Just leave us with something to take out and mull over. You should grab it, okay? No, grab That's, it. Uh, uh, just one remark to Ferry. Um, what Dr. House or any other mini series on television, okay? That's the best uh, for common culture. Uh, investigative journalism and the authority of the media. Uh, there is no way you don't 
have a, an, you know, an authority for checking facts. No one can do it. No citizen. And if you look at the, in the media, for instance, what you usually see is just empty websites. They're supposed to be citizen journalists. They don't do it. They don't have the time. They don't have the expertise. Um, so let's not have illusions about that. Um, yeah, I got it. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Frank. Yeah, I think it's useful to distinguish between problems that are journalism, media related, and those that are wider social and cultural. And I think it's important to realize that the question of authority is a fundamental issue that prevails all domains of social experience, from the authority of the parent, the authority of the teacher, the authority of the doctor, the authority of the priest, the pope. Everybody's authority is put to question, so why shouldn't the media be? And I don't think it's useful to particularly worry about what is, in fact, the least distinct dimension of the media's experience. I think what, what the media does have, uh, and, and, and to me this is really the, the issue, is, and we're skirting around all the time, is has the media got something to say? Right? I mean, that's the question. Is there something that needs to be said? Right? Because it seems to me that all this talk about commerce or business models or everything else assume that, that there are these incredible journalists who are dying to say this incredibly important thing, but somehow they're being restrained by the forces that be. Whereas the reality is, is that uh, most of the time there isn't strong opinions, there, are, there aren't truths that are being pursued, there aren't you know, sort of real uh, crusades uh, uh, on behalf of ideas. Uh, what there is is a, is a kind of sense of ennui and a certain complacency and a crisis of ideas. And I think that's really what, what is the distinct element. And I think many of, almost everything that we're discussing is actually a reflection of that. The good thing is, is that we're getting the occasional technological fixes. And it's only a fix because it's got no durable long-term consequences. But for a variety of reasons, because of technological innovation, there is a, a lot of possibilities for ideas to kind of, and, 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 and other things to kind of bubble through in a way that, you know, in a sense, tiltillates our imagination, because it's nice to get other points of view kind of being transmitted in ways that are quite unexpected. But at the end of the day, the, the question becomes, what does the audience do here? Because it seems to me, I'm looking at a lot of students here, and the question becomes, what is your role? I mean, how seriously do you take yourself? How seriously do you take your ideas? Do you want to say something worth saying? And I think if you do, then you all find your ways of saying it. That's always been the lesson of history. There's no reason why that should change now or in the future. Ava, Ava's there. Oh, no, yes. That's okay. Sorry. No, yes. go no, ahead. Absolutely right. Okay, so I think there are crusades and there are a few journalists, very few, I'm talking about Hungary, who are doing their job very well. The question is that what kind of spheres do they have to work in? Uh, are they going to have the possibility to work? And it depends on the political situation. Or I don't know if you read that interview with um, Anna Maria Salai today on Index and what she was saying about regulating the media. Uh, right now she says that she's not going to regulate uh, the uh, uh, user-generated content. I'm, uh, I'm really curious how she would do that anyways. But... Uh, uh, yeah, uh, maybe there are going to be online spheres where these journalists may um, possibly with like European fundings could work. If not, well, that's a big danger. I think we've had some very strong and good ideas from virtually everyone here today. I, I've learned some things and I'm very grateful. I think, Eva, your point about policy and and Esther's point about being careful not to lose the quality uh, work along with all the excitement of entertainment. And, and Frank's very important contribution about how uh, journalists in many mainstream organizations have lost touch with both ideas and the people. That's a pretty serious indictment, and I have to agree with you. But I'd also like to be a little provocative, because that's what we were supposed to do tonight. Um, I think the very best journalism ever done by professional journalists is being done today in some places. Because look at the tools. 
I mean, the Wall Street Journal was able to bring down a lot of the titans of the uh, of, of corporations by looking at a, an algorithm with the help of a Yale mathematics professor, uh, looking at an algorithm that determined whether or not the dates that they said they were getting their stock options cashed were actually possible, feasible, given the way they reached the peak of the market every time they cashed in their options. A mathematical, data-based journalism is one of the areas in which professional journalism is really superstar now. They can crunch data in a way and help us make meaning of it in a way that, frankly, WikiLeaks can't. WikiLeaks needs a partner, which is someone with judgment and curation skills, and frankly, a public spirit that says not everything should be public. Um, so that's one thing. It's out there. It's excellent work. You just have to find it. That's my next point. You have to pay attention. The power is shifted from those who are speaking to you to you who have to figure out whom to listen to and also what you want to say. That power is a profound shift, and I know it's a lot of responsibility, and a lot of people would rather not have it, so they don't do anything. But my third point, my last point is, you get what you pay for, folks. If you aren't going to pay for anyone to be thoughtful and take the time to look at the records of the mechanics fixing the airplanes and consistently check that over time, even when it's boring to most people who want the popular dig, most emailed cat video, which I happen to like too. <laughs> but you've got to pay somebody to pay attention, and they better have some values that are transparent, and they better put their name on it, and you better hope they have institutional heft so that when they do get an expose, somebody will listen. Can I ask you all to thank our panel? <laughs>